Hello and welcome to another day in Brussels. I'm just walking through some of the old back streets now and up the hill which you can see ahead in the distance towards my destination for today which is the Indusee Clo Museum. Here we have a street with several very old houses. Uh, there's a mansion there and then here on the left you have the famous Old England building. I'm now at my destination which is the Museum of Fine Arts and this is the turn of the century section so you can see we have several very well-to-do looking members of the Belgian bourgeois in the gallery here and the 19th century was a very prosperous time for Belgium and indeed much of Europe as a whole However, that prosperity was based on industrialization, and there was a desire to get back to more naturalistic pastoral scenes, such as these in a classicizing style, and also a desire to explore some of the triumphs of the new industrial world. This portrait of Constance Meunier, which you'll see in a second, is evidence of one of Brussels' finest industrial painters. Here we have a bust by the French sculptor Auguste Rodin, who um, was one of the most famous sculptors of the similar period. Along the rest of the gallery we have several pictures of 19th century interiors and you can see how many luxury goods were beginning to become more commonplace due to trade expanding throughout the world. This painting is a very large one of early man in a classical style. You can see he's got man's best friend already, the dog. Now we have some paintings by Hippolyte Boulanger. These were heavily influenced by the French uh, Barbizon school, which was interested in nature and the wilds during the mid 19th century. Here we have the view over Brussels as it used to be. And now we come to some works by Meunier, who self-portrait we filled before. Meunier was interested in exploring the dynamism of labour and industrialisation in Belgium. And I particularly like this. This is a triptych of industrialisation. A triptych is traditionally something like a church altarpiece. So you can see how important industry was becoming to Belgian society at this time. Here we have a picture of a travelling family, which was very poor, taking their fuss. Despite their poverty, they're able to say prayers. On the other side, we have a taste of exoticism from the mid-19th century out in the um, Moroccan Peninsula. And finally, to round off this section of the museum, several pictures of society ladies looking very sophisticated and well-dressed. Moving on now, we can start to see the late 19th century influence, some work done in a slightly less realistic style, more of a pontalist or impressionist influence coming through, and I particularly like this one, particularly the colour of the, the hair. Yes, here you can really see the pontalist style made up of several dots of paint. This caryatid by Rodin here represents the dividing line between the realist section of the gallery and the symbolist section. Symbolism was a 19th century movement which sought to represent important principles through symbols and allegory. It was heavily influenced by both classical mythology, which we will see here with Fernand Knopf's painting, The Riddle of the Sphinx, and also by medieval iconography which we will see shortly here in this painting by the English artist Edward Burne Jones. The twin influences of classicism and the Middle Ages were transformed by the symbolists into something wholly new and modern. Here we can see some preparatory drawings which are heavily influenced by the Middle Ages but are in a much more realistic style than anything that was produced during that period. In addition, 
symbolism was also influenced by the theatre and the late 19th century operas of individuals such as Richard Wagner, who had a very bombastic style with heavy medieval influences. This painting just ahead is a picture of a musician playing the violin. Symbolism used new materials in the 19th century, such as ivory, which came from Belgium's colonies in the Congo. The Belgians did some horrific things in the Congo, but these materials from elephants were relatively cheap, and this enabled them to make excellent sculptures. Because ivory is a very soft material, these sculptures were able to have more detail than nearly any before them. The stage influence of symbolism did not just extend to opera. Here we have a painting of Ophelia from Shakespeare's plays. Here we have a work by Emile Fabry showing that symbolism was not just about an aversion from naturalism in fantastic subject matter, but also in simpler forms and more expressive shapes. These sculptures, which were produced for churches, show signs of the new concepts of forms that were made possible by this movement away from pure naturalism and classicism. Symbolism was tied up with the decorative arts movement known as Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau sought to take natural forms and apply them to furniture and other forms of decorative arts, including pottery. Here we have some very fine late 19th century pottery and glassware. You can see the highly colourful and naturalistic lines of Art Nouveau throughout all of these works, including the sculpture. One of the greatest 19th century symbolists, John Dalville, painted works such as this known as The Treasures of Satan. This allegorical piece shows the male artist trying to escape from the snares of wealth and women, which could corrupt his art. We're about to see one of my favourite works in the collection, also by Jean Delville, which depicts the Greek bard Orpheus. After being torn apart by a grief of enraged women, his head and his lyre were thrown into the river, where he sailed down, still singing, until he was taken by the gods. The remainder of the gallery features art and objects such as this one, as well as classicizing paintings but redone for 19th century taste. Art Nouveau, with its naturalistic lines, affected all aspects of design and craft. Here we have a room done out in the Art Nouveau style, down from the chairs, to the fireplace, to the paintings. Symbolism was closely related to Art Nouveau, as this painting of Parsifal, A Night from the Holy Grail, shows. You can see a very naturalistic background and lines. Art Nouveau drew upon numerous influences which were available in the late 19th century. These vases, for instance, reflect the influence of Japanese prints which were becoming increasingly common in the West during this period, while these lamps reflect the influence of country gardens found in places such as England. The naturalistic lines and curves were popularised by a large group of artists, including Alphonse Musher, and Gustav Klimt, who are probably the most famous. 
Finally here we have the drawing that I showed you earlier by Bernard Knopf in its final painted form. You can see here Arthurian legend brought to life. In these new, fancy, Art Nouveau rooms, masterpieces such as this would have been the, pro the, pro the province of the new bourgeois. And with that, my time at the Finder Seaclin Museum at the Museum of Beaux Arts is done. I'm now about to head to my next destination, Berlin, leaving behind both the museum and this wonderful Art Nouveau music building. On the right you can see there, the Old England building. I'm heading to Germany on board a train known as the ICE or Intercontinental Express. It's a very fast train, but I do want to point out one of the things I'm going to see on my journey, this Cologne Cathedral, one of the most impressive medieval cathedrals in the country. The adventure will continue in Berlin.